Ward is the lead editor of the ARRL Handbook and the ARRL Antenna Book, of which I own all of them. Um, he's also uh, done all three of the ARRL license manuals and study guides. He released a well-received grounding and bonding for the amateur radio um, in 2017, and recently authored the third edition of the Ham Radio for Dummies. As an electrical engineer, he designed microprocessor-based products and medical devices for 20 years before getting a second career in writing. He's co-founder of the World Radio Sport Team Championships and was inducted into the CQ Contest Hall of Fame in 2015 and is also the president of the ASME Foundation. Hopefully I got all that right. <laughs> Sometimes I sleep. Well, thank you. It's, it's over to you. Okay, all right. Well, let's see if we can get this share screen business working. All right, I want this. Share it. And then I want to turn it into a slideshow from the beginning. Okay. Are you seeing that properly? Yes. It looks good here. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I've given a couple of presentations where I get several slides in before somebody goes, uh, excuse me, but we're not seeing anything. So, all right. So this is uh, basically a, a refined version of a presentation that was developed for Contest University, which runs um, at the Hamvention every year. Uh, they'll probably run it online again uh, in 2021 since the in-person uh, Hamvention has been uh, suspended. And it's really a great day of good stuff. It's not just about contesting, it's about station design and how to get COM ports on your computer running and you know all these kind of things. It's really good stuff. And uh, that's all sponsored by ICOM. So I wanna thank both of those, uh, uh, Contest University and ICOM America for sponsoring the presentation. Okay, so the goals of this session are we're going to uh, discuss the terms ground and bond. They're, uh, uh, widely overused and, uh, som and sometimes have overlapping or conflicting meanings. So we're going to talk about that because they're the fundamentals of how, um, how we get our uh, hands around safety and lightning protection and stuff. Um, they all have, those things have different requirements. So we'll start from the basics and work our way up. I'm going to discuss issues and techniques uh, for home stations. So uh, not talking about mobile, but portable. And this is a basic home station approach. The really big stations have a lot more things to worry about. So this is not a uh, K3LR size talk. It's more like an N0 AX wire in the backyard or a, uh, a tower on a, a single tower or something size station and it's primarily an HF uh, oriented talk. We're gonna talk about how to approach things um, with a common grounding bonding system in place so that you can satisfy all the requirements by doing one set of things uh, and not have to worry about doing grounding and bonding three different ways. And I'll provide a list of comprehensive resources to uh, follow up. And if the NCARC so desires, I can provide a set of PDF slides of the presentation so you don't have to scribble everything down as I'm going. So, all right, HF station owners, uh, if you're building a new station, this is a perfect time to get your grounding and bonding working so you don't have to take it all apart and redo anything. But uh, say you're, you're starting from scratch, um, you've got all your stuff in boxes on the floor, that's the right time to uh, think about your grounding and bonding system. Maybe you're upgrading a small station. We all start with uh, some stuff on a desk or a table and then it gets bigger. And um, uh, so it's time to upgrade your small station. Another good opportunity. Oh, maybe you're adding an amplifier. Yes, you'll find out all kinds of things about grounding and bonding. So uh, this is a good uh, opportunity for you to think about it. Maybe you live in lightning country. I know Colorado is lightning country. Missouri certainly is lightning country. That's where I'm from these days. And uh, so lightning is important. Maybe you're just trying for better performance of your station and wanna know if the grounding and bonding can help. So we'll talk about this stuff. Here's my primary ham radio references for you. The ARL handbook and, and uh, antenna book are full of information about 
grounding and bonding. Uh, sometimes they're in the station um, building chapters, they're in the safety chapters, safe practices. Um, I've been making sure that information gets put in those things. Then there's the NEC handbook, which I have a copy here. Oof. You can see this is a big book. This is not the National Electrical Code, which is a much smaller book. Uh, this one actually has rationale and drawings and explanations and all sorts of things to help you do what it says. You don't have to know everything about the NEC handbook, but um, it's a handy resource. These are free, uh, freely available at your library. There's only a few of the chapters and sections that apply to amateur radio, so you can copy them or um, study them at your leisure. Another uh, good reference is a three-part series of articles in uh, 2002 QST by Ron Block called Lightning Protection for the Amateur Station. I highly recommend that. Ron gets into um, a number of important details and techniques for lightning protection. Jim Brown, K9YC, has published a lot of material on his website, k9yc.com. And uh, the two primary references applicable to this topic are power grounding, bonding, and audio for amateur radio, and his RFI ferrites and common mode chokes for hams. Both are wonderful tutorials, and he updates them relatively frequently, frequently so download them and, and take a look. NW8JI, who lives on a hilltop with a 300-foot tower in Georgia and knows a lot about lightning, uh, has some good web pages on ground. And then, of course, there's this book. This is a much thinner book than the uh, NEC handbook. Um, I started writing uh, hands-on radio columns about this in 2016, and it generated a huge amount of interest and it became quickly became obvious that we needed to pull information together in a format that was approachable and useful to the average ham, and that resulted in this book. Um, it covers AC wiring, uh, lightning protection, RF management, which is my term for how we deal with the various RF currents in our station. And it had some really good reviewers, including Jim Brown, ARL Lab, uh, Ron Block from Polyphaser, uh, some other guys uh, who are lightning experts. And um, they did a very good job of keeping me from making uh, mistakes. They're the ones that are the real experts. Um, and I learned a lot writing the book. If you want to learn about, a lot about something, write a book about it. And there are a lot of examples for you to use, but it's not a cookbook. It's more of a toolbox and, and a tutorial about the basic concepts. So uh, let's plunge right in. What is ground anyway? It, it's a word that we use a lot. It has different meanings. It can be a thing like an earth connection. That's a ground connection. And that's how you talk about it when you're talking about AC power or lightning. It can just be a local reference potential or voltage when you're talking about circuits or RF. Airplanes, uh, for example, talk about, they talk about ground for avionics, but I don't see the planes dragging a chain. So uh, ground is just a local reference uh, voltage that the circuits and the equipment use. It can be a verb, it means an action. I'm gonna ground something, I'm gonna ground this terminal. Um, what that means is I'm gonna connect this to my reference potential or voltage. And it can be an adjective. It can be a ground wire or a ground system or a ground terminal. And so you hear people using the word with all three different meanings in the same sentence of like, I'm grounding the chassis to ground with a ground wire it means three different things in one sentence. So you have to be very careful about how you use the term. And there's a couple of other interesting ideas. Um, I continually stress this. Um, a lot of times we think, and I certainly was this way when I got started. Um, hey, I'll put a ground rod in there. That's zero volts. What's what's the problem? Uh, well, the earth is not zero volts. Um, it's not a magic sink into which all current and lightning and everything else just somehow disappears if you connect it to a ground rod. The earth has um, impedance of its own, and we have to take that into account when we talk about our ground systems, uh, particularly if we're talking about lightning. Um, so we'll uh, cover some issues having to do with 
uh, what the earth is not later in this talk. There are also some fuzzy definitions. Um, I try not to use the term RF ground because there really isn't any such thing. There is just a local common connection that we use as a reference potential at RF. And it depends on the frequency and the wavelength and all sorts of things. Um, so try not to use the, the term RF ground because that implies more than what these connections really are. And, and then there's ground loop. If you talk to an electrician, a ground loop is um, a bad thing because it allows error currents to flow um, that become very large, uh, it creates magnetic fields that create a hum, 60 hertz hum. If you hear a sine wave at 60 hertz, that's probably from a magnetic field. Um, but if you look at a typical ham station, and if you look for loops and connections that are at ground potential, you will find hundreds of them, even in a small station, because every connection through cables and shields between metal enclosures, that's a loop, and you can't get rid of that. Um, so you have lots of ground loops. Um, this typically is a term that we can use at AC power frequencies um, and DC and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, it's not the universal problem you think it is. You have to be careful about what you're trying to describe. And then single point ground. What does single point mean? It means electrically small um, uh, so that uh, everything is at the same voltage. Well, electrically small at AC power means uh, the wavelength down there is like 5 million meters at 60 hertz. So something electrically small can be the size of a football stadium and uh, still be a tiny fraction of a wavelength. Where you talk about 10 meters, electrically small means something on the scale of a couple or three inches. So there's a, a wide variety of things that uh, are considered single point. Basically, all that means is a connection at which all the connections to whatever this is uh, that's being touted as a single point ground are at the same voltage at that frequency and wavelength and current level. So there's a lot of uh, it depends uh, that come behind these terms. Let's talk about bonding. Uh, bonding is just a connection that's intended to keep two points at the same voltage, however that is done. And the idea is when you have two things bonded together, everything goes up and down together. It's like using a floating dock uh, so that you don't have the boats doing this as a wave come by. Everything goes up and down together. And when you don't have voltages that exist between different points, what causes current to flow? Voltage. OK, so if you don't have any voltage differences and everything's at the same level, there's no current that flows between these two, volt, uh, these two points. And current is what causes um, RFI and, and other problems. So what we do is by minimizing voltage differences, so everything goes up and down together, and we do that by bonding, we minimize current flow in our system that causes RF problems, safety problems, lightning, um, potential differences, all that kind of stuff. It prevents shock hazards from voltage differences. When you have everything bonded together and there's a short circuit or some kind of a fault, um, you don't have a hazardous voltage that's appearing on one piece of equipment. Um, it also prevents um, these lightning surges. When you hear a story about well, I was just sitting there and there was a lightning strike nearby and all of a sudden this giant arc appeared. Well, the arc is caused by voltage differences. And when you bond things together through a common ground system and um, in your shack, in your home, in your building, and everything is going up and down together, you don't have these big voltage differences that cause arcs. So we prevent voltage differences uh, by bonding. And then I'll reiterate that we limit the current between devices caused by voltage differences uh, from RF pickup. And we are right in the near field of our stations. So RF pickup is a big deal. Bonding sounds real hard, but it's really easy. And a lot of it we're probably already doing, uh, but you just need to think about what it is uh, when you're making these connections. It sounds expensive, like we have to use special techniques, special clamps, some welding, adhesives, all this kind of, no, no. It's just 
connecting things together. You have to use the right materials and hardware, but we have most of this stuff already. When you do your bonding properly, I just want to wrap my arms around this. It works in your favor across all three of these domains, the AC safety, lightning protection, RF management, bonding is a good thing. So uh, take an opportunity to do it, do it right, and it will pay benefits. Okay, so bonding is going to work. It has to be low impedance. Um, that means the connection between these two points has to be um, essentially, um, it can't create a big voltage drop on its own. So we have low impedance and it has to be short. Why does it have to be electrically short? Because um, if it becomes, say, a tenth of a wavelength or longer, it starts to act like a transmission line and or an antenna. And as we know, uh, as ham radio guys, uh, when things start acting like transmission lines and antennas, uh, odd things uh, happen. A connection between point A and B, um, if that's a quarter wavelength at the frequency of interest, that's an open circuit. There is no connection between A and B, even if we have a wire there. And if it's a quarter wavelength long, you've got uh, infinite impedance between these two points. So the connection also has to be heavy enough to carry the expected current. So if you're talking about uh, AC safety or lightning, where the currents can be large, short pulses, that wire or strap or whatever has to be heavy enough so that it doesn't blow itself into smithereens. There's great uh, YouTube videos out there of what happens to unfortunate uh, uh, small conductors when they're hit by large current pulses. It's fun to watch, but you don't want to have it happen in your home or around your station. And it has to be sturdy enough to survive the environment. A lot of times you'll see building codes specifying number six, number eight, number uh, two, number four uh, type connectors. Why do they have to be so big? Well, first of all, they have to carry the expected current. And if you're talking about lightning protection, which is um, lightning is in kilo amps, uh, that's kind of a scary uh, concept. Um, then that conductor has to be able to handle it. The other thing is these are buried uh, conductors typically, and uh, there's frost heaving, there's uh, rototilling. Don't ask me how I know that a rototiller can pull up a ground wire and break it, okay? Uh, what you want is some kind of a wire out there that when you accidentally hit it with a shovel or a tree grows around it or there's frost, uh, that wire has to be strong enough to stay connected. Uh, maybe a number 12 would do the job electrically, but uh, if you broke it uh, by digging around or something, you might not even notice. And then it would be broken and you wouldn't even know. So you have to have a big sturdy connector. Inside your station, what do you use? The standard is strap, 20 gauge solid strap. Um, it can be a little heavier, a little less heavy. Um, just flashing, bits of flashing will work. Uh, you can buy strap um, or you can use heavy wire, all that Romex that we never throw away because it, we might use it someday. This is perfect for these short pieces of stuff. Uh, strip it out of the Romex, number 14 or larger is great uh, wire to use. If the equipment has to move around, uh, maybe it vibrates uh, like in a, a car or you want to roll a rack around or something like that, you can use that flat weave braid that you see advertised uh, and sold for automotive and RF uh, grounding. Um, it's made to be used and exposed and it's tin coated so it doesn't corrode. You can use that. Do not use exposed braid from old coax because the instant you take it out of that protective jacket, um, that's bare copper. It will start to corrode. And, um, and pretty soon it looks like a ground connection and your voltmeter may say it's a ground connection, but at RF and other frequencies, it's a noise making poorly connected uh, conductor. And you won't see that used anywhere commercially or in the military. And there's reasons for that. Never use braid of any sort where it's exposed to the weather, where it can get wet, um, or it can be exposed to chemicals. All those little wires that are so carefully braided together, um, the water and the corrosion stuff gets in there and it's bad, okay? So don't, don't use it. Use solid strap or heavy wire. 
let's talk about AC safety. Um, everybody uh, is pretty much comfortable with simple AC wiring, uh, but what we're talking here is about grounding, and it has several names depending on uh, where you live in the country and how old your electrician is. Um, equipment ground, third wire ground, green wire ground, the common term today is equipment ground. And these need to be low resistance uh, because they have two purposes and two purposes only. They provide a path back to your AC system's common voltage point uh, for fault currents. That's short circuits. Those can be heavy currents. And the idea is the ground wire is heavy enough so that if there's a short circuit, it can carry that big current back to the circuit breaker box and, and trip the protective component, whether it's a circuit breaker or a fuse, and remove power from that circuit. It's a safety thing. Also, if you have leakage currents from poor insulation or bypass capacitors or whatever, that leakage current that going to flow through your enclosure of your appliance or whatever um, is going to go back to the, the AC safety uh, service entrance and not through you. So uh, that's one function of it. The other function of these ground connections, including the ground rods um, outside your house and at the bottom of your pole, are they just stabilize the AC power system voltage when there's a big fault or transient uh, like lightning. Um, there are, these are not particularly uh, solid ground connections, these little butt wraps on telephone poles and stuff, but there's so many of them that they help stabilize the voltage so that your AC power doesn't go to the moon when uh, somebody uh, hits a power pole and causes a line to line fault. So there's only two purposes for this stuff, um, neither of which has to do anything with uh, lightning or um, RF. So you keep your ground condition uh, connections low resistance for AC safety grounding. Here's the basic idea. You have a power pole transformer with uh, two phase power that comes into your house. If you take off the panel on your service box and you look at the scary stuff, you'll see a couple of main uh, breakers. And then there are two buses in that box um, where all the white wires go, that's the neutral bus. And there's where all the green or bare wires go, that's the grounding bus. And the grounding bus is bonded, usually mounted directly on the metal enclosure of the service panel. Um, the neutral is connected back to the center tap of the transformer on the pole. And most poles have a ground connection of their own out of the pole. OK, so in nearly all service boxes, the neutral bus is bonded to the ground bus with a main bonding jumper. And that's a big heavy wire that connects those two buses together. The ground bus and the metal enclosure are connected to your grounding electrode. That's um, a ground rod. The current standard practice is two ground rods, uh, eight foot ground rods, about eight feet apart. Um, that's how your AC safety grounding is done. And all of your branch circuits come back to these neutral and uh, ground buses. There are some circumstances in which case you do not connect the neutral and the grounding uh, buses. That's covered in the uh, NEC handbook and in um, safety books. Uh, they will tell you this is usually for outbuildings and basements and uh, garage type panels, sub panels. Uh, pay attention to these rules. I was unaware of them before I started this book and now I'm very sensitive to it because uh, there are electrocution hazards associated with improper ground connections. Learn the rules and follow them. And here's how to do it. This is a great book. I recommend this all the time. It's like 20 bucks uh, list price. And you can get it for a lot uh, less than that at um, uh, various online sources. But if you go down to the big box store, you can get that complete guide to wiring um, by Black & Decker publishes it. Uh, Cold Spring Harbor, uh, Cold Spring Publishing is the uh, actual author. So get one of these references. There are others out there. This is the one I recommend. Follow the rules for subpanels and outbuildings and, uh, and do things right. Uh, I think we can all kind of rough our way through running a, a three-wire branch circuit. But when it gets complicated, 
and you've got all these different kinds of breakers and uh, four-way switches. I don't know how a four-way switch works. It's not possible to do it in this universe, but somehow it works. Um, there are so many different weirdo devices out there now. Get one of these books and follow the rules. And then at the end of when you do major work in your house, some places require you to use a pro electrician, many don't. Um, and it's always up to us to make a decision on what we do. Uh, get a pro electrician to come out and uh, inspect your work. Just have them look over your shoulder and say, yeah, that, that looks pretty good. And, um, and pay them for a half an hour of their time or whatever. It's cheap, uh, cheap verification that uh, you did it right. And sometimes they'll spot something and say, hey, this is really dangerous. You need to fix this. And remember that your local code is the law. Um, it's not there to make your life miserable. It's there to make your life longer and uh, not uh, create fire hazards. So these uh, codes have been developed over many years through a lot of pain and agony. And uh, I highly recommend that you follow it. Also, uh, uh, your insurance may insist that uh, you have followed local code or have had a licensed electrician do work. So, you know, uh, they may resist paying for damage if you don't follow the code. So anyway, be warned. Let's go to lightning protection. Lightning comes from way up in the sky and it's a charge imbalance between the atmosphere and the earth. And every once in a while that imbalance gets big enough for there to be an event in which case the charge rebalances itself. That's what lightning is. Lightning comes from thousands and thousands of feet up in the air and you can't steer it. Um, what we do in the last uh, 10 or 20 feet, um, lightning barely notices that we are even here except as a convenient terminal. Um, but you can help Mr. Lightning make good decisions. So that's what we're trying to do with lightning protection. We can't uh, prevent a lightning strike, but we can help minimize any consequences of a direct or nearby strike. So what you want is to give Mr. Lightning what Mr. Lightning wants, and that is a heavy direct path to the earth, meaning the soil, so that it can dissipate the charge. It may or, be a very big charge right here, but then it dissipates. Did I hear a question? Yeah, we've got a question that just popped up here. The NEC yep. requires a six AWG or thicker bonding wire and doesn't yep. mention anything about strapping, which is, which is obviously better due to the skin effect. How to satisfy the NEC and provide a really good grounding slash bonding question. Ah. Okay, um, the NEC deals with AC and some lightning issues. And so when they specify number six AWG, um, that's what the inspector is gonna look for. So when they talk about uh, number six AWG, they're, they're talking about your ground system, which is typically outside the house or between major subsystems. In your, in your station, when you're trying to bond stuff together uh, behind your equipment. Uh, the NEC, as long as this stuff is connected back to your outlets, uh, it's satisfied. But we need additional bonding uh, to prevent voltage differences between pieces of equipment. And the standard there is 20 gauge strap or number 14 wire uh, or larger wire. But you don't have to get into the number six AWG. I hope that kind of addresses the the question. Okay, um, on uh, lightning protection, lightning is an AC event. It starts at DC, but the primary energy is between 100 kilohertz and 10 megahertz, and it extends up to VHF. That's why you can hear lightning static um, if you're listening to SSB um, on two meters, for example. So what lightning cares about, since it's an AT AC event, is inductance. Um, it's not so much a resistance thing anymore, it's an inductance thing. And even straight wire has inductance. A straight piece of wire one foot long has uh, 330 nano henries of inductance, I think. And when you hit a straight piece of wire where the uh, voltage across an inductance is equal to the rate of change of the current times the inductance, and the, and the rate of change in a lightning strike is um, 
many kiloamps per microsecond. It doesn't take too many nano Henry's before you have thousands of volts from one end of a piece of wire to another. You can get over a thousand volts in a typical lightning strike in a six foot piece of wire, straight wire, not coiled. So inductance is very important. You want low, straight, uncoiled um, uh, connections. And all of these paths, these low inductance, heavy direct paths to the earth should be outside your residence. Don't invite Mr. Lightning to go through your station or your house on its way to the earth. All these paths need to be outside so that when you get hit with some lightning energy, it finds its way to the earth outside of your, your residence or your station. Here's an example. Um, and furthermore, all of you uh, that are putting in all these different ground connections outside, all the earth connections shall, is the magic word in the uh, electrical code, shall be bonded together. And that means connected together. OK, why is that? Um, when you get your AC service installed, somebody comes, they put in the box, they drive in the ground rods, they run the number six or whatever it is from the panel out to the ground rod. Terrific, good job. Then the telephone person comes up and they put in their box and they run a ground rod and they run a wire to that. Good job. There comes the TV person, either the satellite or the cable, and they put in a, a entry a connection and they have a ground rod. And then you put up a, an antenna on the chimney to pick up TV or FM or maybe ham radio. And like the NEC tells you, you run the number eight wire down the side of the house to a ground rod. All of that meets code individually. None of those ground rods are connected together. Okay, remember we talking about everything going up and down together. What are those ground rods connected by? Dirt. Okay, they're connected by dirt. And what is the resistance of dirt? Is dirt um, low impedance? It is not. It has a lot of resistance and um, that's not a good thing. So if I have a big kiloamp surge and it's flowing through 20 ohms of dirt, what do I get between point A and point B? I get 20,000 volts. And um, if you don't bond these external connections together, um, you get a, a big, big voltage difference between different subsystems in your house because they're connected to these ground systems. And that's when you hear stories about, I was sitting there minding my own business and there was a thunderstorm and suddenly a giant green arc jumped from my computer to my TV to my phone and now nothing works. That's because the ground connections were at different voltages. So what you do is you run a heavy conductor outside from ground rod to ground rod to ground rod, and you create what's called a perimeter ground around your residence. It doesn't have to be a complete ring. Um, it's hard to run ground wires under driveways and things, but you want to connect them all together. And then they're connected by a heavy, direct, low, low impedance connection. And that means you minimize the voltage differences. Everything goes up and down together. Here's an example. Um, say you've got a tower outside. Your neighbors might call that a lightning attractor. Um, you've got a tower with a beam or some kind of antenna outside. And um, it's connected to your nice entry panel right here. And you've got that connected to a ground rod, just like it shows you in the various books. And then you've got feed lines that go to your radios. Your radio is connected to power supply that goes through a branch circuit over your service entry, which has its own ground rod. OK, well, Mr. Lightning comes for a visit. Uh, it either hits the antenna or something nearby. And the surge comes down here and it says, oh, look at this great feed line connection. I'm going to go over here. And yeah, there's a ground rod. But uh, there's also this terrific connection to another ground rod over here. So a lot of me is going to go this way. Lightning's no different than any other current. When there's a junction and there's two circuits, uh, depending on the impedance of each circuit, that's how the current divides. So if you've got a decent path through your house, some of it's gonna go through your house and uh, that causes problems and things get blown up and uh, don't work anymore. So what you should do is this. Here's another good example. Lightning is always hitting the power lines. Here it comes, now you've got a nice perimeter station lightning protection ground system outside. 
where everything's bonded together to ground electrodes. Every 10 to 15 feet, you put in a ground rod and, um, and bonded them all together. You've got the entry panel here. You've got your service entry panel. They're all connected together. So here comes Mr. Lightning, comes to your AC service entry, and it says, wow, this is a terrific ground system. I'm going to go here. Maybe a little goes this way, but a lot more goes down here. That's where you want it. It dissipates out into the earth. If you're talking about a tower, uh, you've probably seen this kind of a drawing in the various handbooks. Uh, if you're looking down on a tower, you want to have a concrete tower base, and then you have a separate ground rod for each leg of the tower. Um, and uh, those are all tied together with a ground ring. So this really grounds the base of your tower. If, as long as you've got the guy out there with the backhoe, have him dig about a 30 foot trench for each one of these and run a heavy wire and some more ground rods in this trench and connect them to your tower. That makes a terrific low impedance, direct heavy uh, connection to the earth. Lightning hits and it spreads out into the earth. That's what it wants. Give it what it wants. Um, you want to bond your feed lines to the tower as well, because uh, remember we talked about the inductance and how much um, voltage can be developed. If you get a good lightning strike on your tower, you can have easily 100,000 volts of potential between the top and the bottom of the tower. If your feed lines are not bonded to the tower, the shield can be at a wildly different voltage than the tower. And so I don't know of too many coax uh, jackets that are rated for 100,000 volts. What happens is you get arcs through the jacket. And uh, so you have splits and holes and water gets in. And it's bad. You can minimize that by bonding your feed lines to the tower using a, one of these little grounding brackets that you can buy or a grounding kit from uh, uh, one of the hardline manufacturers, whatever. And it, yeah, it's kind of a pain in the neck, but it's not as much of a pain in the neck as troubleshooting and replacing feed lines that got damaged by lightning. If you've got an insulated base tower, uh, put in a spark gap, which can be nothing more than a pair of heavy wires that are crossing together and they're separated by just enough that uh, the lightning voltage will arc over between them. Uh, it's just like uh, gapping a spark plug like we used to do in the old days when we could actually work on cars. And then uh, at your entry panel, uh, you create a single point ground that is uh, everything coming into your station is all on this one panel. So that's a very small electrical short, low impedance connection. And then you connect that to your perimeter ground system. Um, typically, that's a piece of metal. Uh, mounted on a non-flammable board, and that's attached to the foundation of your house somewhere. Uh, this is the great place. If, if possible, mount this near your AC service entry so that all of your grounds are together. Run your coax, your telephone, your cable TV, everything to this panel. Keep the unprotected stuff, all these wires that are coming in from elsewhere, your feed lines, uh, keep that all over here and then keep the protected stuff, which has been connected to uh, uh, the various um, protective devices, keep that over here. Otherwise, lightning will jump from one to the other. It'll jump across a gap. So keep the gap, keep these bundles of wire apart. And then you want to run your feed lines to your station from this panel. Here's uh, the stuff that's on that panel. This thing right here is a surge protector. It's also referred to as a protected line duplex out outlet, PLDO is a common uh, acronym. These are not that expensive. They're uh, anywhere from 30 to a couple hundred bucks, depending on how much energy you're talking about and um, uh, various mounting options. This one in the picture, I think I got for $35 uh, online. And uh, you buy as much energy rating as you can. That's what's inside to dissipate transients. And then you bond the metal enclosure of that thing to your station ground. On the right over here is uh, a typical surge protector for a telephone line. You can see these little MOVs. These are gas discharge tubes. 
And uh, these things right here that look like transistors are called transorbs and they're back-to-back -back, uh, zeners. So these, uh, these will protect the low voltage uh, connections. That also works for rotator, control lines, telephone uh, data, that kind of stuff. These are the familiar lightning arresters that we've seen in catalogs for many years. These have a gas discharge tube inside of them. And uh, so any, uh, any lightning that comes down the center conductor will arc over in this gas discharge tube. The voltage goes way up, then it arcs over, and then it's clamped to a very low voltage, 15 to 20 volts, until the energy is dissipated and the gas discharge tube acts like an open circuit again. Uh, there are types of these that have capacitors in series with the line that makes the voltage arc over uh, quicker, but that also blocks uh, DC power if you're using it to power a preamp or some other device. Uh, check to be sure you ordered the right part before you put it in line. Don't ask me how I learned this, okay? Um, but be aware that there are different types of this stuff. This is what a single uh, point ground panel looks like. I've got one of these at each of my three tower bases. Um, I live on a hilltop uh, uh, and uh, I call it the Crawford County Cumulonimbus Discharge Facility. Uh, I know things get hit by lightning. So I have one of these panels um, at each of my tower bases. This is a piece of aluminum uh, roof flashing. That's perfectly good stuff. It's mounted on a piece of board inside a uh, electrical uh, fiberglass electrical box that I got surplus. This is a uh, RCS4L lightning switch uh, with the uh, gas discharge tubes inside. This is the main feed line from the house. Here is the uh, big ground wire going to the ground connection right there. And these are gas discharge tubes um, that protect my rotator control line. And here's a money saving tip for you for these long runs of uh, rotator control stuff by irrigation cable, irrigation control system cable. This is 10 conductor number 18. And uh, so you can double up. You can see I've got doubled up here. Whoops. Hang on a second. I've got doubled up uh, wires here. So I've got heavy wires for my solenoid circuit and the lighter number 18 for the rest of the um, um, for the rest of the low voltage, low current connections. Uh, this stuff is way cheaper than the special um, special uh, rotator control cable and uh, you can bury it. It's made for direct bury. So you can buy this stuff by the thousand foot spool online. And then you run the special rotator cable up the tower in that last uh, 50, 60 feet and save your money. This is another example. This is K4RO. Kirk's shack is up here above his garage. This is where the garage is. And he lives on a hilltop in, near Nashville. And he was getting hammered by lightning all the time. So he got tired of that. He was losing gear with every storm. So he got a big piece of aluminum. He mounted it on the wall. It's grounded. Here's his ground wire goes to the ground system outside. And everything having to do with his antenna system is mounted on that panel. Since doing this in several years, he hasn't lost any of this equipment, not one piece. So it works. Here's another single point ground panel. This is in my station. I have a surplus rack. I mounted all the good stuff in the rack. You can see I have uh, little areas for radios over here, and those are bonded uh, to this rack. And inside the rack, here's a look at the back. You can see my heavy duty uh, ground wires here. Here's a wire from one station. Here's a wire from another. And this big wire goes to the perimeter ground system. And all the protective stuff is mounted on the metal of this rack. So the whole uh, rack acts as a single point ground panel. From the lightning protection uh, standpoint, this is from Ron Block's QST articles. He talks about the idea of creating a protected zone. Everything inside this red line is what you want to protect from lightning. So what you do is you connect it all together and protect every single line that crosses that boundary. Every power connection, every power cord, every feed line, everything, every telephone line. Um, because if you don't, if you leave one or two wires unprotected, that's where the lightning gets in. So 
you bond the equipment within this zone, bond it all together, and protect every line that goes back and forth. That creates a protected zone. And you can do that for home entertainment systems, your computer systems, all that kind of stuff. Let's talk about RF in the shack. Um, first thing to remember is that everything in your station is an antenna. Everything in your station. That includes you. Uh, you're in the near field of an HF antenna. Your 40 meter dipole in the backyard. What's the wavelength of 40 meters? 40 meters. How long is that? That's 120 feet. And so that's only one wavelength. The near field of antennas is typically out to about 10 wavelengths. So you're in the near field of all of your HF antennas. And if you run power, um, even 100 watts, uh, you have significant amount of electromagnetic fields that you're there. It's, you can't do anything about it except uh, maybe uh, build your shack inside a metal shipping container. So everything in your uh, shack is going to pick up RF. The jumpers, the feed lines, your grounds, your AC safety wire, everything is just going to pick up this stuff. There's nothing you can do about it. So you have to assume that to be the case and work around it. OK, so forget about creating a zero volt point. You're just not going to do it. You might be able to create it at one frequency, um, maybe uh, on one band for one configuration of equipment, but it's a very fragile idea. Bond everything together. Just think up and down together. Everything on my operating system, uh, on my operating desk, it's going to go up and down together. Keep your connections electrically short using strap or wire, and it keeps everything the same voltage. And I remind you that uh, RF current, which is the stuff that causes RFI, is caused by voltage differences. If you don't have voltage differences, you minimize the amount of current flowing between point A and B. So, and that's what causes the trouble. So bond it all together, and that will minimize the voltage differences that cause current. Amplifiers, high RF field strength, and extra attention to bonding. If you are adding an amplifier, you will find the weak spots in your bonding, I guarantee. But remember what you're trying to do, and you'll have a good toolbox to work with the problem. And you can really do yourself a favor by creating a common RF reference plane or a grounding bus. You've seen this picture forever in all of the books where there's a copper pipe behind the equipment and, um, and stuff is connected to that. And then there's a, a line that goes off one end that says ground, ground rod. OK, that's the basic idea. You create a bonding bus behind your equipment, under your equipment. A half inch copper pipe works great. Aluminum bracket works great. And um, you use uh, ground clamps. You can use the same ground clamps that work on a half inch ground rod. There's no difference between a ground rod and a copper pipe. And um, so you use wire or strap to get to your equipment enclosures, including the ones that don't have power, like antenna switches. So everything needs to be grounded to this ground bus that creates that common voltage. So everything goes up and down together. And it also reduces the sensitivity uh, to physical configuration. We've all worked at stations where it said, well, if I'm going to operate 15 meters, I have to move this over here. And I, I can't touch this at the same time I'm touching that. Well, that's because um, of the RF voltage and current that are flowing around this station. Bond everything together, and it goes up and down together. No hot spots, uh, no sensitivity to phys physical configuration. This also works at field day, uh, where we're typically throwing all of our equipment onto an unfortunate card table and trying to get it to work. And then you spend an hour uh, trying to get it all to not uh, reset when you key up. Um, all it takes is a piece of aluminum foil on the table with everything clip leaded to that aluminum foil. And then maybe you connect it to ground rod or you don't. But the idea is to get it all at the same voltage, so it goes up and down together, and that solves a lot of problems. Use the shorter coiled cables. I know we can't hardly buy anything that's not six feet long in terms of computer cables. Coil them up. Uh, reduce the amount of area. The area is what causes pickup, OK? Um, magnetic field, electromagnetic field in a loop uh, causes voltage, so you want to minimize that area. 
use the bonding bus, use a ground plane under your equipment. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, but the idea is to minimize the loop area, keep your cables together, always use shielded cable, even for um, like switches and things like that, so that you have a path for that RF to come back and go to your uh, bonding system. Short straps or wires whenever you can. Here's an example. This is a basic Costco folding table that I built uh, my station with. I took a piece of number 12 a boring old aluminum flashing. I bought a roll of it down at the big box store. I rolled it out. I took some sheet metal screws and I went pew, 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 uh, into the table. Do not do that on your antique wooden table. Okay, but if you just got a, a junk desk or a metal desk is really good for that. Um, lay out the flashing, set your equipment, all your cables on it, ground the, um, uh, connect the bonding bus. You can see a uh, little a blip of my half inch copper pipe back here. I use that as the connection for the wires and the straps from the equipment. So that's connected to the aluminum. And then there's a big wire that goes to the rack there. That's all that looks like. I just created a reference plane. So all of the, let's go back and talk about the ground system. And we've talked about three different types of um, of safety requirements and bonding requirements, the AC, the lightning, and the RF. Okay, remember that all currents flow on all wires. AC safety uh, ground currents will flow just as fine on something you intended for lightning or RF. The current doesn't go, hmm, I'm a lightning current. I can't flow on an AC safety ground. Sure it will. Uh, all currents flow on all wires. So by doing this, correctly and using the right wires everywhere, you wind up creating a single solid ground system. And that satisfies all three sets of uh, requirements for AC safety, lightning protection, and RF management, and Queen Audio, which is really important for phone operation and for digital modes where we have very low level audio signals going into a microphone connection, for example. Bonding is your friend. Okay, and then that perimeter ground system, which is outside the building, whether it goes all the way around or not, um, that helps get that lightning energy, keep it outside, give Mr. Lightning a path to the earth that he wants. Here's kind of the schematic. This is a picture in the, uh, in the book. Um, it's also in the handbook and the antenna book now. Um, it shows here's your building exterior. Um, you've got your single point ground panel, which is where your antenna cables and phone service and cable TV come from. Your tower is grounded. There's a bond between the tower and your, your uh, perimeter ground. And uh, people say, well, my tower is 200 feet away. It doesn't hurt to run a bonding conductor back to your main uh, ground system. The military grounds everything, bonds everything together out to 200 feet. And um, typically, I think 50 feet is practical for, uh, for hams. But go ahead, bond the two. It doesn't hurt. And if you've got an extra conductor in, buried in the, the earth, that's another good ground electrode. Here's your service entry. Here's all your stuff inside. You've got your ham radio stuff. Here's your RF bonding, bonding bus and uh, reference plane. That's connected to this entry panel. It's all bonded together. Your whole house, your tower, everything goes up and down together. So there's no destructive or interfering voltage surges. Ward, we're at about eight minutes here and I've got a couple of questions I wanted to throw in for I'm you. I'm just almost done here. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, these are your resources. The National Fire Protection Association, um, that's the author of the NEC, okay? Um, the National Association of Electrical Inspectors, lots of good information there. What are they looking for? Mike Holt, Mike Holt Enterprises is a training uh, site for electricians. Lots of tutorials. Polyphaser, uh, you've seen their products, I think, um, and they have uh, white papers on lightning protection for even for ham stations directly. Directly, And then there's the Lightning Protection Institute. Wonder what they're about. And then these are the standards. If you really uh, are having trouble falling asleep, these are the big books that you uh, can look at and you don't have their budget, but you can look at them and say, okay, I see what they're trying to do. What can I do with the resources I have? 
And then there's some uh, books out there. The ARL Technical Information Service is full of good stuff. Electrical safety, grounding, lightning protection. And that's pretty much it. So I can answer questions. Uh, go right ahead. OK, so the first question is, is there a way to measure the effectiveness of your ground system? Megger, uh, go mark? through. <laughs> um, not really. Uh, there are consultants out there that can do a great job of estimating effectiveness if you want to if you want to pay them. But basically, the idea is to follow best practices, have somebody that knows what they're doing, uh, look over your shoulder, and then observe the effect over time. Um, if you've got a nearby person who's been successful in, uh, say, securing lightning protection for an extensive antenna system, go over and see what they did, and then try to do that yourself. But uh, there's no uh, ground effectometer that you can buy that uh, will tell you in so many numbers whether you've got a good ground system or not. You just want to follow your best practices wherever you can. Okay, another question here. How deep do you like your ground rods? Well, that's kind of a personal question, ain't it? Um, the uh, ground rods are supposed to be eight feet. Uh, most of the benefit has occurred within the first uh, four feet. I understand, uh, and I, in Crawford County, uh, what we call uh, dirt is really rocks uh, coated with a thin uh, layer of soil. Uh, if you look in the NEC handbook, there are a number of alternative installations then straight down uh, that work for ground rods. Uh, you can lay them in trenches. You can drive them in at an angle. The idea is to um, get as much copper in contact with the earth as you can. There's also this thing called an oofer ground or a slab ground where you run uh, a wire inside the concrete of your slab and you use that. I don't know how well that works for RF. Uh, there's a lot of different configurations for that. It kind of acts like a large capacitor uh, in parallel with a relatively low resistance resistor to the earth. I would still add ground radials outside. Okay, another question here. Uh, most computers do not have a case ground connection. Same for a lot of accessories, including mm -hmm. Astron power supplies. Is a three wire AC cable ground adequate or should we add a separate ground connection to the case? Um, Typically, that's okay, but it's um, a ground connection that goes inside to who knows what of how things are connected inside. The ground systems, they do worry about them because they don't want to violate uh, radiated and conducted EMI standards. But for ham radio purposes, it really helps to find a, a connection to the ground frame, the grounded frame of the computer. That's typically available at the uh, video connector uh, where they have the little tiny screws. Uh, you can run a screw in there. Um, I also ground things like uh, my USB hubs, stuff like that. Um, it's it's kind of hard. Every computer is a little, little different. Um, it'll help. It'll help some try to find a connection, connect that to your grounding bus and uh, see what happens. Other questions? That's all we have so far. And here Thank we are with three minutes left. We're um, in good shape. It's, it's a, a, you know, I keep, I wanna just stress that this, this is a list of practices to follow and everybody has different circumstances, particularly if you live um, in a place where you have a second floor station, what are you gonna do? Uh, you can't run a six foot wire to a ground rod or if you live in an apartment or if you live in the desert and you don't have any dirt, um, what are you gonna do? Um, so you have to look around, you have to do some research, you have to say, okay, these are the best practices. How can I get close in my station? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Hi. Fantastic presentation. This is Joe K0NEB. Hi, Joe. And I thought I'd tell you guys that I featured Ward's ideas and mentioned his book in my December column. And I did exactly what he was talking about. And I saw my noise levels, my, my background noise levels go from an average of S7 to S1, S2 
by mm -hmm. just following the grounding. Grounding helps uh, when it gives those uh, noise currents someplace else to go. And um, another thing that uh, people are starting to pay attention to is putting common mode chokes at the um, various uh, pieces of RF equipment to keep RF currents that are on the outside of the feed line from getting into the equipment. Once they get into your equipment, you can't get them out again. So ferrite on the feed lines is a good thing, not only at the antenna, but at the uh, transceiver, for example. I did that on my uh, feed lines as they come in into the house. Yeah, mm -hmm. Great, great idea. Yep. Chuck Councilman, W1 Hotel, India, Sierra, has written a couple of papers on this. Uh, Joe seems, uh, Chuck seems to have about 150 pounds of ferrite in his station. I've never seen a station with so much ferrite in it, but he said his noise, uh, received noise, went down dramatically. It's incredible. Yep, same thing with W5ZN on uh, VHF. He says, uh, I, I dropped uh, 10 dB on my noise floor. And that's huge at VHF. He says, uh, now I can hear my neighbor's uh, stuff, but it's an improvement. So Joel, uh, Joel uh, really endorses the general idea.